voting's over, but we'll take your, your comments. Oh, I thought they were still going. Well, we've got to, we're going to talk about them. Uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, however, all those comments, questions we get to this day are going to meeting will be put on our website online so everybody can hear the whole range of interest to in El Paso history that people wanted to say at this first ever El Paso History Summit tall meeting, Town Hall meeting. All right, we also are making sure everybody knows that we are streaming this program live online. If those of you who are here with us today have friends in other cities that you want to have them know what we're doing, text them and tell them that they can go online and find us at www.ustream.tv. That's El Paso History TV at Ustream. So go to Ustream, search El Paso History TV, and you'll be able to see us, as is, live here in El Paso. Uh, people here at the summit, can you, you can text them, get them in, uh, tuned into what we're doing. We can also get, take a phone call. Now, the young lady whose phone number I'm giving out is Sarah Belger. And Sarah, if your phone rings, it's because somebody from somewhere in the country is calling you. That number is 244-6847. That's a 915 area code, 244-6487. Call that number online, and uh, we'll take a question from you. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up a question from Sarah and then bring that out to you. Also, we're on Facebook at where? At where? El Paso, El Paso Hist Her History Radio. And also El Paso Heritage Alliance. We're all over Facebook these days. Also, we want to thank Clear Channel Radio because they've been promoting this for us all week long, actually for two weeks now. And they've also allowed us as the El Paso History Radio Show to be uh, part of this summit and actually stream it, stream it live uh, with their blessings. We're also using their microphones today. Why not? And they're going to get them back. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> They'll get them back. But as it is, we want to thank you all for coming. We're here live in the, uh, the Scenic B View Ballroom. That's at 1340 Murchison here in central El Paso. And basically, we all want to thank another whole group of people that is known as the El Paso Heritage Alliance. And that's a new group of old history people, some new young ones as well. They're in El Paso, and they've decided to make a difference. You'll be hearing more about this new group as we go into the future. And also, we want to thank this, uh, this El Paso Scenic View Ballroom for helping underwrite today's event. They gave us a heck of a deal on the room, which is how we can do this here today. Our purpose is to ask the people of El Paso to bring their ideas about El Paso history to share with everyone. I mean, what is El Paso history? That's the question today. And we want to ask you all to vote on the wall. We're going to talk about those topics, to record yourself at I Am El Paso. And this is going to be happening all afternoon here. So we have the booth over there that's called I Am El Paso. Throughout the afternoon, what I'm going to do occasionally is say, what do you think is, an, is El Paso? And we say, let's try something. When you hear somebody say, we are El Paso, your response is, I am, I am El, Paso. El Paso. Let's give that a try. We are El, El Paso. Paso. All right. <laughs> okay, we are El Paso. I am El Paso. Oh, that's getting better. There's a lot of us who are El Paso here today. Thank you for that. <laughs> Melissa? Well... Um, what I want to cover about today is, like I said, we were tweeting, and uh, as I mentioned and overlap myself here, apologize. We have talked to people attending today, and we want to make sure that you do vote, and we're going to be discussing these things at the town hall meeting. And as our audience came in, you were given your five stickers. Now, did everybody get their five stickers when they came in? Yes. Have you all voted? Yes. Yay, that's good. I see lots of colors on the wall back there. Yeah, and there's some very interesting topics. I'm really excited to hear about these. Um, and they're going to be counting those votes and talk about those topics first. Um, we've also asked everybody to write down their comments or questions, which you have there with that yellow page. And we'd like you to turn those in. And we've selected a number of those questions to read. Wendy, are you taking the questions over there? Wendy, 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 are you taking the questions? Then the yellow sheets over there? OK, there's, I see a yellow sheet or two here. Get your comments or your questions ready to go and get them over to Wendy. Okay, so however, all those comments, questions we get today are the meeting, like I said earlier, is going to be put on the website online so everybody can hear about this, see the full range of interest, and uh, people wanting to get their say will have their chance. There you go. And yeah. need, oh, you take it back. I mine need the was, script back. Mine was lost stuck. Back. See, you guys don't see what happens on the radio show. We do this all the time. It just sounds like we don't, but we do. As it is... Um, we had invited our state senator, Jose Rodriguez, to help moderate this town hall today, but his legislative duties kept him in Austin. So we, our other moderator that we already asked is a fellow named Bernie Sargent, chairman of the El Paso County Historical Commission. And good morning again, Bernie. Afternoon. Well, somewhere out there on the Internet, it might be morning. 
Get that mic going over there. All That's right. true. We could be talking maybe over to Hawaii or someplace like that. That's right. Well, actually, I'm expecting a call from uh, Arizona. There's a lady. We, we planted a shill in Arizona. We think she's going to call in. But anyway, Bernie is, is one of the four host groups that created this El Paso History Summit. And we also uh, would ask Bernie at this point, as one of the four groups, take a moment, Bernie, and explain the El Paso County Historical Commission. Yeah, thanks, Jackson. I appreciate that. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. This is great. I really love this. This is great. Yeah, the El Paso County Historical Commission is an organization that was founded about, oh, 1952, 1953 time frame. And the reason that the, the governor of the state of Texas decided that they needed to have commissioners appointed by the county commissioner's court was because of this propensity of losing one's uh, identity. And Texas has a very strong identity. Trust me, I know that only too well. I've lived here twice. The first time I swore I'd never come back, and now we've been here 27, going on 28 years, and it's my new home, and I really appreciate it. But uh, they formed this organization to um, perpetuate the history and culture of Texas county by county. So we have over 250 county historic commissions. And I'm proud to say that our El Paso County Historical Commission is one of the leaders when it comes to introducing new means by which you reach out to the public, you reach out to your constituency. And I really, really appreciate the fact that we've got a strong board, we've got a strong uh, commission, and we've got uh, a commissioner's court that supports us 100%. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us. And if anybody's interested in becoming part of this commission, we serve a two-year term, and uh, we're appointed in the odd years. Maybe it's because we're all kind of odd. I'm not sure, quite sure about that. But we are appointed for two years and then uh, hopefully reappointed. We just had our elections uh, this last week, and uh, I was fortunate enough, blessed by these people, to re, uh, uh, re-vote me in as chairman again. Is that eight years? Uh, it, yeah. Well, Thanks. it will be at the end of this next cycle. So they doubled my salary. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. You all so, need to understand something. Bernie has been one of the hardest working people in that job. That's what, you kind of reinvented it. A round of applause for Bernie, please. <laughs> Actually, uh, just Thank an aside, you. Bernie, before you introduce the guests you've got, there's two people here, the sergeants, who are workers in the front line of the El Paso history industry, and here they are working again today. Thank you both. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. We'll pick up our check at the end of the summit. Yes, <laughs> very end. No, did you hear the term sequester? <laughs> yeah, we got sequestered, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but just a couple of things that really motivate us, Melissa and myself, and I'm thankful. We have our own business that helps a lot, but especially to have a wife like this that supports me in all my little endeavors here. Uh, without her, I couldn't be doing all these wonderful things uh, for the community. But a couple of things to keep in mind when you're talking about the heritage of your community. One is, is if you look at uh, the Travel Association of America, when they ranked all the different types, different categories of travel, of visitation, number two was heritage and culture. 24% of the tourists were related to heritage and culture. So you see why we're excited. We have so much of it here to promote. In the state of Texas, if you look at uh, their rankings right now, they're actually uh, number three in the state of Texas. Obviously, because of the Gulf Coast outdoor, kind of picked up a little bit uh, of, of numbers there. But we have a tremendous following in heritage, and we are committed to save that heritage. And to that end, I wanted to introduce, if I could, uh, Daniel Frescas. Could, where, is, where is Daniel? There he is. Come on up, Daniel. Let's give oh Daniel a hand. God. He's vice president of the El Paso Mission Trail Association. A real conquistador. Yeah, I, right. I kiddingly said he's the original pothead. Yeah. <laughs> Well, just for wearing this pot, you know, I think I, I have to talk to you about the fun things and the uh, important things and serious things that, you know, we've had the opportunity to do. You know, I'm a returnee from California after 38 years, and I am having a ball. And the reason is I have the opportunity to discover, you know, this amazing history that the Mission Trail gets to promote. I mean, we start with celebrating the first Thanksgiving of the Southwest, which is an amazing thing, really, when you think about it. We all know about our Puritan history, but do we know about, you know, a trek of 400 colonists across the Chihuahuan Desert in the middle of winter, you know, literally running out of water and ending up on the banks of the Rio Grande with two days of no water and starting, you know, what they did at that time, which was beginning of our history, our culture, or at least 
the blending of the European and the Native American culture into what we are today. And it's really amazing. I mean, I have had such a journey myself. It's kind of a journey of rediscovery, you know, because you learn what our families did, you know, and what has happened for the last 400 years. And to me, it's just been an amazing, fun journey of rediscovery. I invite you all to come to the first Thanksgiving of the Southwest event, which is gonna be held April 27, 28, to help discover your history. And, you know, I mean, what did people live like? What did they do in those days? How did they manage to get by when, you know, they couldn't find ways to sustain themselves in droughts? Well, one of the things I found out is they harvested salt and sent it down to the silver mines. And it was an amazing hardship and a journey of, you know, fighting off our other component of my, my bloodlines, you know, the, the Apache Indians and, you know, just how people lived and survived and, you know, eked out an existence in those days. And you, if you learn, you know, about your history, you've, you've, you've plasmed something on to your, to your own self-identity and the identity of, of your children and so forth. So I invite you all to become part of that and learn more about the Mission Trail Association and your history. So thank you. If you have any questions about our organization. Danny, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. What were the dates on that uh, Thanksgiving, Daniel? 27th, 28th, right? 27th and 28th of April. Okay. Go to your website, Google uh, First Thanksgiving, El Paso, Texas, and then you'll find it. Hey, Bernie. Hey. We are El Paso. We are. I, I am El Paso. El Paso. Thank you. <laughs> Move on. I really need to take just a second to recognize a couple of uh, folks that are here with us today. We have State Representative Joe Moody. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. And Commissioner Vince Perez. Where's Vince? I think he's busy learning stuff back there, but thanks for being here, Vince. I appreciate that. And in the audience, we also have candidates Jim Tolbert and Robert Cormell. Jim, uh, Robert, here. Where's Jim at? Thank you very much for being here. Love it. Now we have another organization that, uh, well, this organization really is the key to the Mission Trail, the very beginning. It predates the Mission Trail by uh, quite a few years, and that's an organization called CARTA. So what I want to do is ask Sim Middleton, who is the current president of CARTA, to just take a couple of minutes and tell us what CARTA is all about. Where is Sim? We had uh, Sim on the radio show this morning. There he is. There he is. Or Come Ben on. Brown. We'll take either one of you. Take them both. In fact, the first guy up is Ben Brown. Ben, two minutes. <laughs> That's a real two minutes, Ben. I have ben. never been known to limit myself for two, mi two minutes. It's a real Even two minutes. Even when I was asleep and talking in my sleep. You cannot limit yourself to two minutes and say something reasonable. Carter, the Camino Real Trail Association. We've been around for about 10 years. We're interested in protect, protecting, promoting, and studying the Camino Real, which linked Mexico City and northern New Mexico. So it went up and it went down. So here we are sitting in the middle of El Paso, enjoying ourselves, wondering why. Why you're here? You're here because you're on the Camino Real. The Camino Real was the access, the skeleton, uh, the, uh, the vertebral column, uh, the backbone of the communication and things going on between Mexico City and northern Mexico. Remember, through all the whole, all the colonial period, we were on the edge of the world, the edge of Christendom, whatever you want to call it. We were just about to fall off. In fact, we weren't here because we, we were there, there on the other side of the river in Juarez. El Paso del Norte was just the sticks. I mean, really the sticks. El Paso was the other side of the river, what we know as Juarez. So what does um, Carter do? Carter has a publication, and if Troy will run over and stand up, he will get you a wave at you a copy of our quarterly publication. Uh, we do things like have meetings. This fall, September 27th, 28th, 29th, we are holding an international symposium that will probably be in the El Paso History Museum with the Camino Real Hotel, where we will have people coming from all over the Americas to talk about their Camino Reales. So, if you're interested in the Camino, yes. That is the right way around. So if you're interested in the Camino Real in any aspect, uh, we will have people talking about the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, the one we're on, the Camino Real de Texas. That's the other one. I mean, that's the funny one in East Texas. I mean, you know those hicks. 
and we will have people talking about the Camino Real in Panama, in Honduras, Argentina, Venezuela. Hey, you'll get to tour the world and stay in El Paso at the same time. So come and join us. It'll be bilingual, language of your choice. Uh, September the 27th, 28th, 29th. The keynote speaker at the beginning will be John Kessel, a retired professor from UNM. Excellent speaker. He will talk about Don Mieri Pacheco. He lived in El Paso del Norte for 12 years before moving up to Juarez, sorry, before moving up to Santa Fe. And the closing keynote speaker will be that funny little guy we all know and love called David Carrasco. So don't forget to get your enchiladas at his family's place before you come over. <laughs> all right, I hope I've done my two minutes. Do I have anything extra? Five minutes, that's okay. <laughs> you see, even in my sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Ben's been a lot of fun to talk to. He knows history. He knows the history. He works actually for the Mexican government over in Juarez. So uh, speaks fluent Spanish. He has a little trouble with the English. You can tell by his accent there. <laughs> when you get a chance, before you leave, be sure to thank Shelly, Herb, Sarah, Andrew, our sound crew, our video crew over here. Mike Lewis. Mike Lewis. The whole crew. Thank all Volunteers. these people for all the work, all the volunteer hours that went into this. Trust me, it's worth it. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jackson and Melissa, and thanks again for being here. We'll be right back. Bernie, don't go away too far, because we're going to have to ask you or perhaps to help us moderate some of these questions. But before we get into the topics, we have, uh, we have a total here, another high-tech moment. Uh, total here, what's on the board over there. We'll get to these topics in just a second. There's one more person we want to hear from today, and one of the reasons that we decided to cook up the summit was to gather pictures and gather video because the city of El Paso, we as a bond election last, last uh, November, we agreed to buy a digital wall. And the digital wall is gonna go in the History Museum and have everything about the history of El Paso in there, supposedly, and also we'd be able to input into it. So we thought it'd be a good idea to ask somebody from the El Paso Museum of History to come explain the digital wall. So Jim Murphy, if you would come up, he's the Director of Development at the El Paso Museum of History, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to be here, and I really put a beautiful project together today. Uh, we are bringing a digital wall to El Paso. Right now, there's only one digital wall in the world. It's in Copenhagen. We will be the second institution in the world to have a digital wall here. Uh, the first in the United States. We'll be the first in the world to have a permanent wall and a portable wall, the movable wall. We're going to take around El Paso County and uh, the area. And this will be loaded with digital imagery of El Paso's history. Uh, we're working with UTEP, EPCC, the, the different uh, county organizations and city organizations. And we're just going to, we'll be able to put hundreds of thousands of photographs and historical information on this digital wall. And it'll be inside the El Paso Museum of History. And it's gonna be the gateway for history in this area. We're hoping that students and teachers alike Instead of accessing Google, they'll access our wall, and we hope to have all of the information that you could possibly want on this wall. Jim, a question. It's going to be mirrored online? You'll be able to access it online. You'll be able to upload your own photos. You'll be able to download photos. You'll be able to go to the wall and send a digital postcard to anyone anywhere in the world. It's really a, a really high-tech piece of machinery, and we're excited about it. Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Another first for El Paso. And also, we should thank the people of El Paso for buying this thing. Oh, I'm so glad. Yes, thank you for your votes. <laughs> thank you all very much. And also, as we go into this now, we're going to ask Bernie to stick around with us. Uh, the idea of the town hall was to get input from El Paso, what is our history. As I said, the best way we could think about doing it is when you walk in, you get some votes, you stick it on the wall. And now we've got a tabulation. As you can see the wall behind you there, well, it's not real high tech like I said, but you see a whole bunch of dots at a whole bunch of locations. I have here the tabulations of what that was. Melissa, take a look at our first topic. Oh, I gotta get it over here. Ah. I can't see that well. I'm getting blind in my old age. Tourism in Old West El Paso. Okay, Tourism Old West El Paso, topic number one off the wall. Now, I see a bunch of people in cowboy hats. Did you vote more than once? <laughs> ah, 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 That's why they're called shady. Yeah. But you, well, you got a number of votes coming in. You can stick them all on one topic. I guess you maybe well, did. Well, they carry guns, and they ver therefore can vote as many times as they want. We think that's a good idea then, don't we? <laughs> uh, as it is, the digital wall being what it is, tourism old El Paso. 
What does that mean to, to you? Melissa, what does that mean to you? That means that what we're missing very definitely is when I'm part of Six Guns and Shady Ladies, and when we meet people, tourists that come to this town, they go, where is old El Paso? The song, the Marty Robbins song that everybody around the world hears and knows. They come to El Paso and they go, where are the cowboys? Where is the old villages? Where is, you know, they're looking for that tourist item, and we do not have it. We have some beautiful architecture, beautiful country, beautiful mountains, but when they're looking for that specific area, it's not there. There are people I know that are trying to put this together. A gentleman here, Anthony Escobar, is trying to put together an old west town. Wayne Calk, another gentleman, because they understand that is what our tourists are looking for primarily when they come to El Paso. Wendy, do you have a tabulation, some comments on old El, El, west El Paso? No comments came in for that. Bernie, I'm, I bet you you have two cents or more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, I had the good fortune of spending my youth close to Knott's Berry Farm in California, and I saw one person after one person after one constantly going there just to uh, get the ambiance and feel that uh, Old West feeling. And I know that Melissa alluded to the fact that we have this reenactment group. We've traveled all over the Southwest, and uh, unfortunately in El Paso, we really don't have the Old West to show. Anthony's done a great job of trying to promote a piece of property he has down on North Loop. And if you're interested, I'm sure you, you would be, I'll have this, I'll put this, let Anthony hold it. Stand up. Take a look at what he's putting together right well, now. Let's bring it over here. Let's put it on TV. Bring it over. Yeah. Anthony's uh, a descendant of Escobar from Escobar Dairy down on North Loop. And they've got a nice piece of property down there that he would love to dedicate it to an old El Paso. Now, when you think of an old El Paso, you don't look at uh, a community, uh, an area where it's surrounded by high-rise buildings. You kind of have to envision a place that can be used not only for tourism, but also for advertisement, for movie sets, things like that. Case in point, we have a gentleman out of California who's putting together a movie about John Wesley Harden. Hooray, finally. This is uh, the first full-length feature movie that's been produced about John Wesley Harden since 1953. Now, for those of you that know what Harden was like and what he looked like, Rock Hudson portrayed John Wesley Harden in 1953. I don't think so. In the closing shot, John Wesley Harden was wounded, sitting on the back of a buckboard with his son sitting next to him as they rode out of a forced, forested El Paso, Texas, heading off towards his home somewhere in southeast Texas. Well, the folks in California are trying to put together a genuine movie about the life and times of John Wesley Harden. Not a Sam Peckinpah movie, but one that shows the turmoil that was taking place in Texas post-Civil War and how it moved through the history and how Hardin got caught up in this. So it, I'm looking forward to see what happens and how it develops. He's come to El Paso for information and history uh, for the movie, but he's, he was sad to say there was nothing here that he could use other than the gravesite of John Wesley Hardin for his movie. So they're filming it in Brackettville. So these are the kinds of things we talk about and this is what we're trying to promote when we talk about an Old West El Paso. And I think it's a great idea. And I know that Tombstone, which has 30 seconds of history compared to our 30 years of history, gets anywhere between four and six million people a year to walk down Allen Street that's paved over and painted really nice colors from a guy that owns it who's from New York City. Get a New rope! York City. Get a rope! <laughs> So this is, this is what we have or could have to offer to the world. You talk to John Cook, Mayor John Cook. He told me one time he was traveling on, uh, in Europe and he mentioned that he was mayor of El Paso and the first thing these kids say, they couldn't even speak English, went, oh, cowboys. And then you talk to Emma Costa who was over in China on a little tour over there to try to promote business relationships. She mentioned El Paso and little oriental kids, little Chinese kids, oh, El Paso, cowboy. But we don't have a cowboy to show other than those of us that feel like we can dress like this all the time. So anyway, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we're looking at with an Old West El Paso. It's an experience. It's a place that people can really feel like they've stepped back into the 1880s, 1890s, and 1900, early 1900s. Because we have so much history here. So many people spent so much time here. Everybody traveled through here going east and west. We, ha we have the ability. We just need to build on it. And I'm calling on you if you get elected. <laughs> By the way, if you do get elected, <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all putting our beer. Well, no, we've actually d cooked up something this morning on our radio show where we're going to ask all the mayoral candidates for El Paso mayor. The election's on the 11th of May, right? A week ahead of that, on the 4th of May, we're going to ask all the candidates for the mayor's race to appear on the radio show. Either if you can make it in person, we'll love to have you, or if you can't, we'll, we'll pre-tape you, pre-record you. 
but we want to know what you think about El Paso history and were you to be elected, what you might do about it compared to what's being done now. That's the question, and we thought we'd uh, take the opportunity to create a forum. Yep. I just wanted to add something also. Anthony, if I'm correct, there's also a Pan Ponce's Rancho included on your, your old West El Paso? Ponce, like a, like Ponce's home. Come up to the mic. Come up to the podium. And, and Mind you, he's an actor. And yeah, you your should name, know please. How to use and this. who is this, Bernie? Who is this? Who are you? It's Anthony Escobar. I'm Anthony Escobar. All right, and what do you do? What do I do? Uh, I'm El Paso. I am El Paso. <laughs> we are El Paso. I Bernie am Ray. El Paso. Hey, I've lived Thank here you. all my life. My family, uh, my grandfather started the Escobar Dairy Farm on North Loop and Hawkins, which is right below Cielo Vista Mall. And... Uh, I'm happy to say that I am the now bearer of the land. I've inherited the land, and this is where I'm trying to get this old West El Paso town okay, built. Okay, so you, Mr. Escobar, are building an old El Paso. Trying to get it built. Would you need some financial backing? I have the land. I don't have the capital. Anybody with a lottery ticket that wins, <laughs> talk to him. We need to do this. Now, he's also he's adding not just an old West... Okay, talk to Mr. Escobar, a commercial real estate broker in the audience, a brother of one. But, but your point is to build an, an old town. An old town, but not like typical western town. These are going to have structures that do not exist. Actual El Paso buildings like the, the John Wesley Harding building that burned down. Oh, ones that were here. Right. Okay. So it'll be a section of these buildings with the possibility of growing. It won't have rides. What it is is people will be able to come in here and go back in time. There will be people dressed in that period. So you'll enter this park. Uh, they'll have a San Jacinto. They'll have outdoor uh, movies, uh, westerns. Uh, we'll have shops and stores. And you're going to make it so TV people can come shoot videos exactly. in Exactly. In fact, okay. we're, we're in talks side. with people who want to build a soundstage on yes. the property as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate you coming in here today. And something like that set up, not only for the tourist... Not only for the tourist factor, but also the fact of the sound studio, the amount of money that comes into a community when movies are made here is in the millions. And if we all look at our tax dollars, we'd love to have some more people in here paying some more money for us with taxes. All right, did we get all the yellow cards turned into Wendy over here in the corner? Wendy, Wendy can we have the cards because we need to see what's been done. Comment. Comment cards, question cards, and even if we don't use them today in this live town hall meeting, we're going to type these up, put them online so everybody can see what everybody was thinking today. Uh, okay, we're going to move off that topic, tourism, old El Paso. Well, we're not going to move off the tourism topic. We're going to move off the old West El Paso topic because, frankly, everything we're talking about in El Paso history could and should be geared toward tourism. Heritage tourism is, got, is what got us started. Heritage tourism is something that uh, Jose Rodriguez's committee on heritage tourism was doing. Bernie went to some meetings. I went to some meetings. I've never met more El Paso history industry people than at that, that group of people. So we got to working with the senator, put him on the radio, had this kind of conversation on the radio, said, hey, let's do a town hall in person. And he's too busy in Austin, but that's the way that goes. So we're going to do it anyway. But as it is, tourism, I think, is one of the major beneficiaries possible of our history. I mean, not only do we, we have history that we're proud of, we might as well do something about it. Yeah, let's share it with the world. People know about us. Like you said, you go around the world, you say El Paso, they know where they are. You know, we're, we're here. Where our own people, in some case, don't know about El Paso. They well, don't understand our history, and we cannot let it go to the slide. That's the other thing. We don't pretend to think that everybody in El Paso already knows everything. We would like to see the curriculum in the school allow some teaching of local history. Uh, what, do you, what does anybody think about that? If we are El Paso, I am El Paso for that one, for sure. We are El Paso? I am El Paso. You get the idea. I think if we can get this into some of the school curriculum, all we really need to do is get it on that test. If we can get it on that <laughs> test, they'll study it. The anyway, tax. Move, well, moving on to another topic here. Jackson, if I could interject one sure. little thing. You know, when you talk about heritage tourism, you know, how does that equate? Jackson meant that people would be coming here, would be providing jobs, providing tax tax revenue. The average heritage tourist spends $166 per day more than any other tourist. $166 a day. That's great. I'd love to see more and more tourists here. And we do have the CVB represented here too. Veronica Castro, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Yay. We work very hard Appreciate with these it. folks. They're, uh, they're working with us. And we're, we're trying to do everything we can to help them and they're doing the same with us. All right. We got more topics to go. Downtown buildings is our next topic. 
and that is something that's been in the news quite a bit lately. Bernie, when was the date of that? Uh, what was the date of that fire back in um, in the fall? Well, the old State National Bank building, and it was also the original headquarters for the Wells Fargo Exchange, which, by the way, we have souvenirs left over that we managed to pick up and put in our truck. There's some bricks, some stained glass. We also have some of the cornice pieces. I've got the actual bars for the Wells Fargo Exchange, which was on the second floor in my backyard, if anybody would like to make an offer. All of the proceeds are going to be going to the Concordia Cemetery. Was that in December? April. No, uh when was the fire? April of last year. April. A year ago. Okay, so yeah. it's been yeah. a while. But now the other building next to it's been torn down last week, right? Well, they started tearing it down. Yeah, the facades come off. Now, we do have some pieces of that building, too. That was the original block of Old El Paso all the way down to the State National Bank. And there's a couple other buildings that are still original. It would be, I think, kind of interesting if we could keep the facades, let the owner put something brand new inside of it, but let us keep the outside history. I mean, the, the point I make, Melissa, on, on the radio show sometimes is, it's their building, but it's our history. We need some sort of compromise there, please, because we all have to live in the same yeah. city. Keep and the if, character of the building. Well, and if you want us to go patronize your new glass building, it better look like the old one. I'm not going in it. <laughs> it's, that's just me. <laughs> anyway, as we look at the downtown buildings, there's a lot of top discussion about that. Who has a comment? We have um, uh, Bob has got something in here about the... Um, El Paso should capitalize on its historical buildings and, and homes, and that's true. And Bob, you're talking about historic preservation. Did you have something specific in mind, or do you want to just let us continue talking in general? Can't hear you, Bob. Okay. You saw the picture on Facebook? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the bank building downtown was the first one to go. The second one is the other bank building. That John would be building. the historic area right down through there, right, Bernie? I mean, that's yes, the original. Yeah. The corner well, of El Paso yeah. and San Antonio. How many of the Old West incidents occurred right there? You had the four dead in five seconds. Well, El Paso and San Antonio, those intersections were considered by many back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as the most deadly streets in the country. And uh, But on a positive note, it was also... Uh, the fodder for us to grow into what we are today right. with some of the first theaters between the Mississippi and the California coast. We had people like uh, Lily Langtree perform here. We had John Philip Sousa come through several times and perform here in El Paso. We had some very notable people. In fact, John Wilkes Booth's brother and sister performed here in El Paso. They were more, pa they were more famous before the Lincoln incident than John Wilkes Booth was. And they came here a number of times to perform. So we had lots of theater, lots of entertainment going on here. We also had a major discussion on the radio show a few weeks ago and a little bit this morning about what is the, the, the need to tear these down so fast. I don't see it because the, the building owners, in my estimation, have not come up with what they're going to do next. So why are we in a hurry to tear these things down? Maybe there should be a compromise uh, with elected officials to help us work out so that, like I say, we keep our history and they can keep their building. As it is uh, on the downtown buildings, is Troy still here? Because uh, we might ask Troy to, to make a, a, a comment or two. There have been some people, can you find Troy Ainsworth? There have been some people testifying before city council on what should be done or could be done to preserve the history, and, and Troy has been one of those. Wendy, uh, Wendy, are you rounding up these people to, as we can to get, can you f help us find Troy? And uh, Bernie, your other thoughts on, on the downtown building? Well, one of the things that came to light the other day, we had a meeting at the city council, or excuse me, with uh, Joyce uh, Wilson and some of her staff. And uh, what came out of that was we needed to be more of an advocacy group. We needed to be large in numbers and organized when we approached the city, the city council, the planning commission, the engineering department. And uh, from that, we're going to be asking some of you folks to join the team so we can be strong advocates, so we can be El Paso. We are El Paso? I am, I am El, Paso. El Paso. And that's not just a saying to say that, because I think, frankly, if we can get the younger people on their way up to start thinking like that, they'll care about the history. When they get elected, maybe we'll preserve the history. Troy, your thoughts on, uh, two minutes, your thoughts, Troy, <laughs> on the downtown history. These are Texas minutes, not New Mexico minutes, too. <laughs> R really quick, let me add one thing. You talk about the schools and the kids. It was really exciting last night, because we, we had the pleasure of, or we were, had the blessing of uh, being able to judge the Cathedral Talent Show last night. And after we were done, we were talking with the teachers, and this teacher told us, she said, these kids are concerned because they look downtown, it looks like Nagasaki. And they said, this is just not right. We're losing that fabric downtown. And these are, these are kids, these are young men going to our high schools. So they're getting the message. 
Let's talk about Troy for a moment. Troy is the former city preservation officer okay. of the city of El Paso. Now you're the director, executive director of CARTA. Yes, that's right. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Troy Ainsworth. I am the executive director of the Camino Real Trail Association. Um, and, and several years ago, I was the city's historic preservation officer. So I'm very intimately concerned with the architecture of, and our legacy, especially in downtown El Paso. So real brief, one of the main challenges, and, and I know everyone here is pretty much aware of it, is that cities change, they grow, they develop. There's an argument to be made for the balance between our past, our present, and of course the future. Oftentimes there's a bit of binary thinking, black or white, one or two, A or B. You can't have the middle ground that if it's old, it has to go to give way for the new. Well, let's be fortunate that our health care program is not operated on a, a similar system because once you reach a certain age, you're gone. <laughs> All right. You're expendable. Well, that's right. Well, buildings, in my perspective, are the most notable public works of art. Architecture is the mother art. And that's from Frank Lloyd Wright, not me, for the record. But one of the most significant aspects of El Paso, my opinion, is the concentration of Trost and Trost designed buildings in downtown El Paso. It is our connection to the smaller towns of Marfa and Alpine and Van Horn, to the big city of Phoenix and Tucson, and more importantly, to Chicago, Illinois. It is our one unifying architectural thread that connects a wide spectrum of American architectural history. Troy, how Sorry. many Trost buildings are in downtown? Oh, ballpark figure, uh, 35 remaining. In El Paso total? In El Paso total, add another, uh, with home residential design, another 15 or 20. So 60 to 70 buildings, perhaps. Just as Oak Park, Illinois, on the west side of Chicago, it contains the greatest concentration of Frank Lloyd Wright designed uh, homes. That's why people come from far away to Oak Park, Illinois, to see those beautiful prairie style homes. El Paso has the potential, the capability, to draw people from afar because of Henry Trost and his work right here. The architecture, of course, is not the only drawing point. We've identified plenty of drawing points that can bring people a key right here to see things of great significance and importance. Spanglish. But it is architecture that is one of the most visible components. So yes, I beat the drum for saving these old buildings. Try. And yes, sir. We are El Paso. I am El Paso. Thank you. You are Jackson Polk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. In, Thank you, everyone. In addition to what he was saying, Max uh, Grossman, who is a professor at UTEP, was on the radio show this morning. And there is actually now a Trost organization starting up that's going to be specifically in helping promote and save Trost buildings and their history. In uh, Tucson, there's actually a Trost organization that's involved with preserving and taking care of the Trost buildings. We have it in Marathon. We have it in uh, Van Horn. Why is El Paso not catching on to this? So this is, this is important. If we could get the attention of our favorite millionaires and billionaires, we'd yeah. love to have them help us deal with this. Or buy a lot of lottery tickets tonight, OK? Or lottery <laughs> tickets. We'll take either one that comes first. The question is, are, the, are there anything being done to be in, ensure that these buildings are being maintained? And I don't know if that's a positive answer on that. It's a matter of city regulation. At this point, I think these maintained buildings is kind of up to the uh, owner. There are certain regulations about several floors, can be how they can be used. But frankly, the developers seem to have uh, the, 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 the reign to do what they want. This is Texas, and if you own it, you can, you can bulldoze it. That's basically how I understand it. We have a, a gentleman in the front row who's been through a bunch of these buildings. Bad shape on the building. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I tell you what, it's just it's what we got, but we would like to see that change so the history is maintained. We're going to move on to another yeah. topic. One last comment. Uh, just one last comment. Also, we're missing very valuable tax dollars. As we as property owners, we're being hit more and more on our property taxes. And when you have buildings downtown that are neglected, not taken care of, and they're only being charged on the first floor, when you have all the other floors, so there's really not a lot of incentive to go above that, those things need to be changed. All right, moving on to our next topic off the wall there. We have off the wall topics. Yeah, I know. Hey. Also, I keep going back to the We do that the on the radio show every week, so this is nothing new. <laughs> All right, the third topic that got the most votes on the wall back here, which is what we're doing today, asking people in the audience as they come in to vote for the topics of El Paso history they think should be discussed and promoted, I guess in the order that we got them here pretty much. The next one is Mount Cristo Rey. Now, first of all, Mount Cristo Rey, yes, Mount Cristo Rey. Well, Mount Cristo Rey is a hypabyssal andesite Pluton, geologically. Easy for it you to say. It was thrust up from the center of the Earth. It never actually broke the surface. Had it done so, you'd have to call it a volcano. But since it just pushed up the Earth, and supposedly what you're seeing now is just the last remnant of it. It was about a mile high, and it had a, a, a piece of turf over the top of it because the, the magma never quite broke through. Once it cooled off, it sat there like a bump on the, on the Earth for millions of years slowly eroded. Then the center of it fell down on itself to what you see today and all the outsides eroded. What you're looking at on the outside of Crystal Ray is where the interior was pushed up. On that outside surface is, is the old lake bed. There were dinosaur tracks in the lake bed. That's why now we have Crystal Ray with dinosaur tracks up on a wall. And it took a while for people to figure that out. But that is what we have. Then we have, that's the, that's the geology. Then we have the religion. The Mount Cristo Ray was established by the group in, uh, in Smeltertown. Smeltertown, those people worked at Asarco. They lived at Asarco. They lived on Asarco property. And the one thing they did for their church was to build the statue on top of Mount Cristo Ray. Yeah, priest had a uh, vision that that's where there needed to be a statue of Christ. Father Lord Costa said there needs to be a statue up there. And at the time he said that, he did not realize whether that was in, he thought it was in Mexico. He wasn't sure it was in America. He thought it was maybe just Mexico. Didn't know it was in Texas, New Mexico, old Mexico. So he decided to have a pilgrimage, go up there and put that up there. They found out it was indeed in New Mexico. But the reason we call it El Paso's Mount Cristo Rey should be obvious. El Paso Diocese used to include that area. El Paso Diocese was cut in 1982. Am I right on that? 1982, they then created the southern part of New Mexico as a new diocese, and from, from, I guess, from Rome, when you make a dividing line, well, this goes on this side, this goes on that side, Crystal Ray is ours. I mean, I don't know how else you can say that. Crystal Ray is El Paso's mountain. So as we go through this, uh, anybody have any, any, is Ruben still here? Anybody have any thoughts on Crystal Ray? He had, oh, okay. Well, Ruben Escondone Jr. was here earlier, and he's the vice president of, of that. Another hardworking volunteer, I mind you, and he's put a lot of work and effort. They've done restoration up there. They keep it when the storms washed it away. They're back up there with their Jeeps, hauling and cleaning and taking care of the statue. Uh, as, as, do we have anybody from the Mount Cristo Ray Restoration Committee here? Because those guys are the ones, that, those families, they are now on their third generation of people who take care of that mountain. The first couple of generations built it. And there were stories about little kids after Sunday school were given a little bag of, of dirt to take up the mountain and dump it in the road, go back and get another one. And they did that with buckets. They did that for years. And they finally built the road. And Urbisi Soler is the, uh, is the artist who created that, that very beautiful statue on top. And that's of limestone quarried near Austin, Texas. So it was a huge effort, huge big thing got done. And now we get to, we get to, to love it and look at it. Some people want to turn it into a state park. It's a Catholic shrine. So you'd have to buy it from the church. So there's your next lottery ticket, okay? <laughs> Bernie, your thoughts on Crystal Ray? Yeah, I, I wanted to mention, too, uh, quickly, you had alluded to the videos that we found online a couple weeks ago. Uh, there's, there's an archive, a video archive program in the state of Texas, and I'm sure glad they're doing it, because there was a piece of footage that I saw from 1941, and it was a family from Houston that used to spend their summers here in El Paso. And it shows them riding donkeys up Cristo Rey in 1941. And you could actually see uh, 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 Soler's house. It was still fairly intact at the time. 
So it was really fascinating watching that. And then you look out over the valley. There's not a whole lot out there, but it's really fun to watch that and to look at it in 1941. So that's one of the videos that I would encourage people to try to, to look at. Can we give something away? You want to, Bernie wants to give something away. What do you got? I got here cool plants for hot gardens. These are, uh, this is a great uh, uh, representation of what you can grow in this climate here. Hold it up so they can get it on the camera. There you there. go. Hold it, hold it steady. And, and what is it about? Plants. Desert plants. All right, you got a number? Hence I got a number. <laughs> yes. Uh, the last three digits are 030. 030. Anybody got a ticket? We gave oh, everybody 30. tickets when they came in today. That would want to be the, one of the early arrivals. Oh, what, is this you, what is this you brought in behind you here? Oh. Speaking of remnants. This is what, one of what's left from the old State National Bank building. Yeah. And we're certainly hoping that the other, the other buildings don't follow suit. But uh, we'll sell this to the high bidder. <laughs> Proceeds will go to Concordia Cemetery. You want a piece of history, huh? Yeah, that's a piece of history. I right, talked to Bernie after the, after the broadcast today. But also, you have 030 as your ticket. Nobody's claiming it. All right, we're going to keep those things, guys. Any other thoughts on uh, Mount Cristo Rey? I wish we could do a donkey ride up there like they do in the Grand Canyon. That's probably arrangeable. That would be a blast. Take Patty, up. come up to the mo uh, podium. Patty Apostolidis. Oh, I thought we had a winner. We have somebody that wants to hog the mic. I'm Patty. I'm Patty Apostolidis. I've been here since I was a year old. And I believe the Mount Crystal Ray is more than just part of the Catholic religion and so far it is part of our history. I remember the first time that I was on Crystal Ray, my daddy carried me on his shoulders up Crystal Ray when there was just the sticks of the cross there before they even built the Mount Crystal Ray statue that we see now. My sister's jealous to this day because she was a year older than me and she had to walk. This was 19, in the early 1930s. I was born in 29 and one of my earliest memories is looking out over the expanse of the mountains and the desert from Mount Cristo Rey. I have had neighbors who say to me, I made a pledge that if my second child was born without the great moles that were on their, uh, the neck of my first child, that if that child was born without those, I would climb barefooted up to Cristo Rey. It is a pilgrimage. It is something that everyone who has not taken their children up there should take their children and go there. The family that has been taking care of it all of these years have fixed that road so that now when you go up there, you can take a wheelchair, you can take a buddy, you they can... push strollers, yeah. People push strollers now. Strollers yeah. and things like that. And people actually walk up on their knees because of their pledged in their religion that they will do that if something great happens in their life. Patty, it's part of the entire El Paso fabric. It's just the fact that it's in New Mexico makes them people in New Mexico kind of nervous. And on top of that, it's just absolutely it. beautiful. The way it is made is so impressive. If you haven't stood below that Christ and looked up there, you've missed a great opportunity for the city of El Paso. Do it. Patty, thank you. We are El Paso. I am I El, El Paso. Paso. Thank you very much. I, when I, the first time I went up there, it was the same way. I was just awed at the view and looking at two countries and three states all in one spot. It, it's amazing. Well, think about the history that that mountain has seen. I mean, itself is historic. It's a 45 million year old hypabyssal endocyte pluton. I think the original and that, name her, was, that happened. The original and, name was Mulo? Mule, Mule Mountain. Mule, Mule Mountain, Mule, Mueller's yeah. Mountain. Well, actually, when, when the conquistador days, that would, depending upon how high the water was, they would go around one side to Ardovino's Desert Crossing, yeah, and have a beer get and a drink, and, and, and keep going up to on. New Mexico. That's why they call it a desert crossing. <laughs> and given on the other days, it would go around and through the Hart's Mill connection. And Hart's Mill is another very historic spot. Let's move on to some of our topics. Um, we have the U.S. military as a topic. That's our next topic. And that's rather broad, but the military history here. Does anybody feel like an expert on, on military? Bernie, you have any ideas on? Because we're starting with U.S. military history. We talked about it on the radio today, how they, Fort Bliss had left. They came back because of the Salt Wars. But they had been here earlier. Mm -hmm. Why were they here earlier? Indians. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, it's fact of you life. <laughs> well, no, it was. That was the reason they established the, the area, the, the list of forts. They go from Fort Quitman all the way up into Fort Selden. There's a whole bunch of forts that were created here to protect, quote, the settlers from the Indians. And I'm sure if you're an Indian, you had a different view of that equation. Well, but yeah, the, the natives, the, you know, the natives, bless their hearts at that time, they, they looked at it a little differently than we did. They didn't believe that you really owned horses. Horses belonged to Mother Earth. And so if you had a horse and it, Mother Earth owned it, that meant that they could borrow it at any time they wanted. Right, it's their horse too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there, there was a problem, you know, and this was their land. We infringed on it, so there was a concern, and I can understand that. We're still here. We're <laughs> U.S. military. Any, any other thoughts yeah, I do. on U.S. The, military? The, the military was a, a fascinating history in El Paso. We're going through a situation right now with the, uh, the extension of the outer loop on the west side, working with the Department of Transportation, TxDOT, and also working with their... Uh, consultants, and what we're trying to do is help them to design an outer loop that is uh, friendly to the history of Hart's Mill and Old Fort Bliss. So the, the, the treatments on the sides of that uh, particular highway are going to reflect the history with the, uh, the oxen, with the forts, with the military, with the cavalry, and they'll be reflecting that whole uh, scenario so people will actually see that history on the side of the outer loop. And then we're also working very closely now to try to get a study done at Hart's Mill. There was so much history there at Hart's Mill. You know, once, you know, once uh, Hart settled that and built his El Molina and expanded it, it was just an unbelievable little piece of property. Very, very, very um, uh, wealthy piece of property for them and now today for us. So we really need to continue to expand on that. Now, they probably would have stayed there for quite some time except for the Department of the Military decided that they would... Uh, let the railroad run their rail right down the middle of the parade well, ground. That story was they had Fort Bliss established there. Yeah. Hart's Mill. Yeah. The second that was time. the second one, yeah. Second place. Yeah. And then the federal government said the railroad's got to go through here mm -hmm. and coexist with the military post, which didn't really work real well, so the military moved out. Well, let me ask a question. How many are former military? Let me see a show former of hands. Former military. First of all, thank you for your service. And secondly, could you imagine trying to march across railroad tracks? Doesn't work too well. It was right in the parade grounds. Is that where it was? It was right in the through? middle of the parade Right down grounds. the middle of Fort Bliss, so the Fort Bliss moved. Ah, the railroad, that's progress. Oh, we need to, to move formation. on ourselves here. Another topic. Yes. Native Americans, another topic of history voted on on the board. Native Americans. Who, who wants to talk about that? I mean, we all do. Because, frankly, I mean, we're referring here, I believe, to Native Americans of uh, uh, Indian descent, what we would call Indians in the old days. And we have a number of them here today, today too. Sorry? We have a number of Native Americans here also with the Piro, Monzo, and Tiwas, as well as the... Those, uh, were, those people were here. As well as the Tiguas. When Oñate showed up, the Tiguas were re-imported here, apparently, yes. uh, by the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. And so the Native Americans in El Paso, the recognized, federally recognized tribe, is the Tiguas of the Isleta del Sur Pueblo. And that is the, the, the Native American tribe we have here. And I wonder how many kids growing up realize that they have an Indian tribe in their county yeah. and what that means. And if you don't know... You really should take your family and go down to the Tigua Indian Cultural Center and take a look at their museum because they explain themselves quite well and why they're here. And you want to take a shot at why they're here? Why they're here? Why? Because the Spaniards moved them. I was just going to say they moved and brought them back. <laughs> or they, they picked them up, took them with them to Santa Fe, correct? Well, they took them from Santa Fe back down okay, to here. Down here, yes. And established the, the Piros came out of Socorro, New Mexico. The, uh, the Tiguas came mostly out of Isleta. The and Monzo's there were some Tom as well. Here. Yes, and then we have all the, the, the tribes, the Indians we had at uh, Keystone Heritage Park, which we really don't know which tribe that is. Well, Keystone so, Heritage predates all of this. All of this. But I'm saying is you, it's a very unreported and very little known history here. Unfortunately, the Tiguas, like you said, going to the Cultural Center, they're bringing up some of the history. You also have the Apaches also that had a uh, presence here too. Well, the way I put it, the Apaches used to go shopping yeah, they in San Elizario. <laughs> they there's also a study I learned the other day that's being conducted out of uh, the East Coast, ironically, by a gentleman who's working on his doctorate thesis on the Kiowas because yeah. they inhabited portions of that's right. Far East El Paso also. Well, there's a gentleman that comes to Waco Tanks, all their events, Dewey Tsatoskoy, I think he said something like that, and Dewey is from, is from Oklahoma. And they have a, a whole claim on Waco Tanks like a lot of Native Americans do. Mm -hmm. The Spaniards first reported uh, Apaches at the Waco Tanks area in the early 1700s. The Spanish were, they had, they, well, they would go out on their missions. The Spanish army would take a chronicle guy with them, a reporter, if you will, who would write down what they were doing. 
they said one day they were approaching Waco tanks, the, the army was, and they looked out and they saw about 300 Apaches already camped there, so they decided to go the other way. Probably a good idea. But also, Waco tanks, there's a, it's not on the list, but I gotta tell you, Waco tanks is a very historic El Paso spot, but we should probably stick to our list. Moving on to missions. Missions, now obviously, we talk a lot about the missions in El Paso. How, how many missions do we have? Trick question, how many missions do we have? Two Three. Plus, plus the Presidio Chapel. The ones that are active on the mission trail, starting at the south, San Elizario, is a Presidio Chapel. And by the way, you can go get a drink and popcorn in the middle of this, obviously. Thank you. Did you bring enough for everybody? And he's going to eat it. <laughs> oh, okay, fair I mean, enough. You know. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Got it. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Well, that's good. Uh, he just bought he brought my enough vote. for everybody. He just bought my vote. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, oh, that's thanks, right. We can vote for you. Thank you very much. But as it is, the mission's being a topic. I mean, are we overdoing the mission topic, or, or can we not do it enough? Somebody say something. I mean, I we talk combined. a lot about the mission trail. We need more? Well, the thing is, the Mission Trail Association now is getting quite organized. Yes. Yes, they are, very much so, and I'm glad to see it. And I think the missions is just, again, all part of El Paso. It's part of our history. I'm sorry, I shouldn't we have We got popcorn, popcorn in our mouth. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we should not do this on TV. But we can say we are missions and we are El Paso. Yeah. El Paso. What was that? We are El Paso. Yeah, and also we are the missions because the missions basically are the first permanent establishment that's still here. There's a lot of buildings that have been put here, they come and they go, but the missions are still here, generally in their general original location, but the whole idea of their history is continuous, even though the buildings occasionally melt with the water and the, and the floods. But the missions are a major part of El Paso's history and, and obviously should continue to be supported. Now you also mentioned, I heard, that were there more than just two missions in a Presidio Chapel. However, the ones that were, were, we can't see them anymore. Something around Fox Plaza, there was a mission there at one point. And if Nick Hauser were here, he'd give us the details. But there was a bunch of missions established in the El Paso area. At the time, they were on the south side of the Rio Grande. The river moved. Then they became part of the United States. So they're now our missions. So, you know, we are El Paso. I am El Paso. We are now our missions, too, because we got the missions off of Mexico. And it was kind of bizarre, I'm sure, for anybody who had a family who was living there one day, the flood happened, and all of a sudden they were Mexicans and now they're Americans. That happened to a lot of people in our valley. That's right. So any other thoughts about the missions? Yes, sir, we have a, a, a gentleman. Come on up. Well, I recognize him. Does this guy Commissioner vote big Vince sometimes? Perez. Vince Perez, hey. county commissioner. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. As, as the county commissioner who represents the historic mission trail, uh, I always make it a point to say that we as El Pasoans, I don't think we embrace the missions ourselves. Uh, how many people in the last five years have been to San Elisario? Now, how many people in the last five years have been to Mesilla? And usually, there are more people it is who have been to Mesilla, and when we have family and friends who come to visit El Paso, we take them out to Mesilla before it is we take them to San Eli. And I think that's something it is that certainly needs to change. El Paso needs to embrace uh, the Mission Trail. We can do that by visiting the, we're gonna have the first Thanksgiving celebration coming up next month. Uh, I think El Pasoans really need to uh, become aware of all these annual events and support uh, all the great work that's happening out there. But I think a second point that also needs to be talked about is that we need to start thinking of activities that will draw children. While there may be a lot of great art galleries it is that are popping up in San Eli, uh, there's really nothing for children to do. But we have so many great assets here, whether it be we establish hay rides or we establish sort of a, a historic trail where uh, kids can come and, and uh, reenact sort of historic trails. I really think that'll help El Paso embrace and bring more families to the Mission Trail. And as County Commissioner, that's something it is I hope to do, but uh, it's something it is I really think we need to do a better job of promoting. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, appreciate it. I like hearing that from our elected officials. Well, I tell you, the mission. Uh, uh, Wendy, could you go find Vince Sanchez? We need him on the next topic, I think. But w as we as we talk about the missions and what can we do about them, the next video I would like to do for Capstone Productions would be El Paso's Mission Trail. It's a matter of funding. I can do what I can to do these for nothing. But at some point, my wife, who has a real job, it only goes so far. So anyway, we're looking for grant money. 
to do the next video we want to do, and that would be uh, the El Paso Mission Trail. Bernie, you got something to give away? Well, we didn't give away the Mercedes or that book previously, so I'm going to call another number. How about 045? Giving away stuff to the tickets zero, that you came four, in with. 045. 045. Who's got that ticket? Zero four five. We're gonna I give. Can, what are we giving away, Bernie? I can Bernie? make a ticket. We're zero, giving the four, cool five. plants for hot gardens. Zero four five. Oh look, she's got that. Oh. Do you? Okay. Do we give it to her? No. Oh, you made that up. I right. had that. I guess we're gonna get to keep all these prizes today. Vincenzo. All right. Fair enough. All right. Our next topic, and I see the man. Go ahead and cross in front of us here if you want. Give me five as you go, sir. Thank you very much for being here. And you shouldn't feel too nervous. He is a reenactor. Sometimes you have to tell people that. He's not but that But our scared. next topic is salt wars. We took a vote on the board. The next topic of importance, salt wars. Now, the salt wars we talked about on the radio. Danny and I talked about on the radio with Melissa today. And the salt wars, what are the salt wars? Vince Sanchez. Well, my name is Vince Sanchez. I am a, a member of the Six Guns and Shady Ladies Old West Reenactors. But I didn't start my reenacting there. My reenacting roots go all the way back to San Elisario, where my grandfather, Antonio Padilla Sanchez, began reenacting history in 1950 there in San Elisario. He first reenacted the first county seat of El Paso, the commissioner's court, along with the breakout of Melquiades Segura by his friend El Chivito, Billy the Kid. Reenacting in San Elisario is very strong. And one of the big events that we have down there, we like to remember the Salt War of 1877. Now, if anybody has heard about the Salt War, the final conflict took place there in San Elisario, December Vince, what, 12th. Vince, what were they fighting about? Well, over in the Guadalupe Mountains area, there is called the Guadalupe Salt Flats. And that was a big source of salt for this area. Now salt back in the day was very important. It was almost like dinero, like money. Because we didn't have refrigerators. We didn't have refrigeration. So the meat was preserved with salt. And we would have different caravans that would go up there to the Guadalupe Salt Flats from northern Chihuahua and the San Elisario area, and they would harvest salt for free. And this was going on for many, many generations. All of a sudden, some politicians got together and said, wait a minute, nobody owns these, these salt flats from what I understand. Let's go out there and con, con Track the government said, you know what, let's make a contract on this and, and we're going to own up this land. And it's a, salt, it's a salt ring of greedy politicians. And one of the headliners there was uh, Charles Howard. And I believe he was from Missouri. I think so. Might yeah. have been New York. Nope. New York Not City. <laughs> Not New York City. <laughs> no, he was from somewhere He was a Midwesterner. Else. Well, Anyways, Vince, the thing, the thing about the salt wars in San Eli, that was one of the things that caused the Texas Rangers to show up? Oh, yeah. What happened to them? Well, when they finally gathered up all these uh, politicians, a few of them there in San Elisario, they held, held them up in a, in a barracks there in San Elisario, and uh, a mob of about 800 armed men and women from northern Chihuahua and the, the surrounding areas had these politicians who had a... a a band of bodyguards, some Texas Rangers, they were surrounded in a barracks there, San Elisario. And the leader of these, this mob, Chico Varela, he had a little bit of military experience from what I understand, because he was, the insurgents there were listening to him very good. He had these guys on top of a building he had these guys on top of a building, Chico Varela. He had these insurgents, and they were shooting down upon the barracks there, where some of the men went upstairs to the roof and were trying to shoot back at these insurgents. This all took place. Well, the timeline took place about 20 years. 
there's different events that took place here in El Paso. These politicians, these greedy politicians began to bicker amongst themselves. And I believe in one of the stores there in El Paso, they shot Luis Cardiz. Well, as it turned out, Vince, it ended up being actually a war that had to be solved by armed forces. Right. And isn't it true that the reason Fort, Fort Bliss had left the area? That's right. I mean, the army had, had, had disbanded Fort Bliss and moved out of the area. And it was because of this event we got Fort Bliss Fort to come Bliss back in. Fort Bliss was reestablished. Well, See, there was no need for, for a military presence there. The Indians were pretty much tamed by then. A band of... Uh, a regiment was coming up one of the roads there and was uh, intercepted by Chico Varela and his men. He, he convinced them to turn back. And all this time they had Charles Howard, Taze, McBride, and some Texas Rangers there locked up in the in that barracks. And that was one of the, that's the first incident that it has ever been known, I believe, of a surrender of Texas Rangers there in San Elisario. That, among other things, San Elisario is very distinct. Well, thank you for being here with us this afternoon. And as it is, you do these reenactments. Yes, on an occasion we do reenactments down in San Elisario. I am also have, I'm a director of the Pistoleros de San Elisario, all West reenactors that were... Well, we're going to be a year old on the 18th of March. On Monday, that's going to be our uh, one-year anniversary. So anyways, uh, I, my descendants are, like I say, four generations in a row of reenacting history. Well, you answered the question very simply then. We are El Paso. I am an El Paso. El Paso. Thank you. Thank you, and Vince. Thank you very much, folks. Appreciate it. All right, moving on to some more topics. We're going to, we got three left there. Neighborhoods is the next one. Neighborhoods. Now, I don't know who, who voted for this. Who voted for neighborhoods? Had to be somebody vote for neighborhoods because there's all kinds of dots all over the place out there. Well, one of the neighborhoods that, uh, that we know is distinct, Chihuahuita. There's an original neighborhood, Sunset Heights. Sunset Heights, Another yeah. original neighborhood. Bernie, other thoughts? McGoffin. The McGoffin. Now, is there a chance that uh, the, uh, the, late, the superintendent from McGoffin might be here? I, in fact, I think I see her now. Oh, there she we is. We have a lady who looks like she just got out of the kitchen. <laughs> Did you and, bring us uh, any cookies? This is Leslie Bergloff, <laughs> superintendent, McGoffin Home. Thank you for being here. Tell us about your neighborhood. The McGoffin Home, as some of you know, was built in 1875. It was built on property that originally belonged to James Wiley McGoffin and that Joseph McGoffin had inherited from his father. When the McGoffin Home was first built, right now it's right in the middle of downtown El Paso, but when it was first built, it was built on 1,280 acres that Joseph McGoffin owned. That means that the property for that neighborhood and when the McGoffin home was built went down to the river. It went up to the hill about where Sierra Medical Center is right now. It went to somewhere between Copia and Piedras and down a few blocks from where the home exists today. So really, that was a huge amount of property. That's a lot. So over time, uh, that homestead of Joseph McGoffin was subdivided. Once there was a flood in that area in 1897, he began to subdivide his land. Um, originally, it was like a farm. It was a rural property. And matter of fact, in 1877, when he moved to the property, the newspaper says the judge has moved to his rural domicile. It was out of town. Wasn't that about eight blocks out of town? Yes, it's about eight blocks out of that town. Far. From where you consider town right now. But remember, at that time, town was real close to the border at that, that, that time. Mm -hmm. um, so the neighborhood began to develop once he began to subdivide that land. And he was a generous man. He gave um, some land for a school, which is San Jacinto School, that still exists there by the McGoffin home, and for a park that um, is close by as well. So the McGoffin home was actually in the second ward for a long time, um, which we, you know, um, now consider the Segundo Barrio. So the neighborhood, as that neighborhood began to develop, uh, and he subdivided the land, there were a lot of people that came with the railroads and began to build some houses in that neighborhood that weren't like the adobe building that Joseph McGoffin lived in. 
And of course, for those of you who don't know, Joseph McGoffin was born in Mexico. And that was the kind of house that he grew up in. He never did move from that house, even though that neighborhood as it developed and there were different styles that were brought from people from the East Coast, that was his homestead. And he stayed there in that home and passed it on to his descendants. Leslie, the yes. idea of the McGoffin home being saved in what, the mid-1970s? Yes. Isn't it true that the McGoffin home represents the, the microcosm basically of El Paso being an Hispanic household with an Irish name? Yes, that, 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 that is right. Actually, you know what? The story of the McGoffins is our story. It's a border story. It's the story of a man who is from a multicultural family. And it's how that family represents the cultural diversity that we find along the border. It's our story. And it's very underappreciated in El Paso. And I will tell you that in the rest of Texas, they know, your legislators know, the Texas Historical Commission, who operates the McGoffin Home right now, is your state preservation office. And we know how unique and important this building is, not just to El Paso history, but to the history of the state of Texas. And that's why this building has, is on the, the st is a state historic site. It's a state archaeological site. It also has national recognition by being on the National Register of Historic Places. Leslie, it's, it's a McGoffin home, the homestead of the McGoffins. We are El Paso, yes? We are, we are El, El Paso. Paso. I am El Paso. And that represents it greatly. Thank you very much. Sure. And we have one note here, no doubt, from a McGoffin. Isabel she Glasgow. She spent a lot of time at that house. Yes, I lived there in, during World War II and then again in 1972. And uh, my great-grandfather was Joseph McGoffin and my great-great-grandfather was James Wiley McGoffin who had the first Fort Bliss uh, several blo blocks down the way from the homestead. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Texas Historical Commission for the incredible amount of money they spent on the home, and it's absolutely gorgeous. May I talk about Hart Mill, Hart's Mill, too? Make it brief. we got two more topics. Yeah. Hart's Mill was part of your family, yeah. too. Yes. My mother and my father weren't cousins, but my mother's great-grandfather was Simeon Hart of Hart's Mill, and I'm terribly worried about it because it's just sitting there. And I'm hoping that the text dot doesn't get too close to it. And it's also the El Paso del Norte uh, crossing, the, the original one, I guess they call it. Wouldn't and, it be great to see that mill come back? Uh, uh, yes, I'd like to see it come back. And I have a few family pictures. And we have a lot of hearts in El Paso, but I guess they got sidetracked with their families and so forth and so on. Well, Isabel, we, got, we need to get to our next topic, but uh, you yes. represent El Paso. We are El Paso. I, I am, am El, El Paso. Paso. And did you get a chance to go record over here in the booth yeah. yet? Excellent. Yes, I did. Thank you very much. And by the way, if you, after this is over, thank you, Isabel Glasgow, for, for coming today. Appreciate it. And I guess we could thank you for being a McGoffin, but that just kind of happened. <laughs> And the and hearts heart. and everything. So you are El Paso. Make sure everybody everybody gets a chance. Be sure to record I am El Paso on the booth there. We're going to put that on YouTube and on the wall. And she's. we were talking neighborhoods. She's part of that neighborhood. She's speaking for that neighborhood Definitely. as well as Leslie. That whole neighborhood there. And, and by the way, I tell you, let's do something ad hoc here. I'll give you a free DVD if you can tell me. No, it's McGoffin Street. It's Bassett Street. And there's one in the middle called Myrtle. Who was Myrtle? Anybody here in this group? You got 30 seconds. Tell me who was Myrtle, and I'll give you a DVD. All right, we'll move on here. 30 seconds. Who was Myrtle? Nobody knows who Myrtle. Herb, do you know who Myrtle was? No, I have, but I have something else to say. Okay. All right, time's up. Myrtle was Mr. Bassett's wife. So that's who that was. Bassett was Center. Bassett yeah. Center, Bassett Street, Bassett et cetera. Towers, yes. just came in the next room. Oh, okay. I'm sure if you'll come down to the time. Very good. All right, we, it's top, speaking of neighborhoods, we got a guy who uh, knows something about neighbors, just walked in. Max, ready to go Hawaii, Grossman, come on up here for a second. I, you said you weren't going to be here, but now that you're here, we've got to put you on the radio to justify to your wife His wife while you're made late him, for your flight. Sandra made him come here. Max, come up real quick. Just want to say Everybody thank, put their shades on. Here's Max. <laughs> we want to thank Max. 
Max Grossman is, is uh, part of the El Paso County Historical Commission. He's getting ready to go to Hawaii for his spring break. Just want to say Buenos thank dias. you, Max. A, a brief moment to, for your thoughts about the summit and the building history. We've already talked about it, but what are your thoughts just real quick? Well, fabulous. It's great to have so many groups uh, come together to think about preservation, think about the history of the city, which is the patrimony of all El Pasoans. Uh, of course, I'm mostly concerned with buildings. Uh, I'm all about buildings, so my Architectural Preservation Committee, 17 members, constantly working to find ways to save our historic structures within the context of economic development. We believe economic development and preservation can work hand in hand, as they do in Santa Fe, San Antonio, and other cities that have a sensible preservation strategy. And of course, this is particularly important at this moment as we all recall um, that there are two Henry C. Trost buildings that are currently being demolished. We're losing two of our masterpieces as I speak. The John Muir Building, uh, which is on San Jacinto Plaza between the Cortez and the Roberts Banner Building, 1916, rest in peace. And the Union Bank Building, next door to the International Bank Building that burned down in July, the Union Bank Building, beautiful ionic facade, uh, that's going too. So working very hard to arrest this process and find a way to sustainably uh, preserve and develop downtown. And uh, we appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thanks thank you. Also. We are El Paso. Oh, yeah. I am. We are El Paso. El Paso. We are El Paso. Yes. I am, I am El, El Paso. Paso. Max, thank you very much. Thank and you. I want to point out, Max is new to El Paso. He's only been here three to four years, correct? That is right. I'm, an, he, I'm a native Minnesotan. <laughs> and a but he fan. likes our history. Yeah. And he's spearheading the movement to help save our architecture in El Paso. So he deserves a big hand. Thank you, Max. Along with his committee. All right, moving on to other topics. We've got two more topics. Railroads. Got to be one of the biggest things that ever happened to El Paso. The railroads moving in. Uh, the railroads came in with five different lines within several, a few years. The first one was what, Bernie, in May 1881? Yes, sir, 1881. And, it, and as that hit the fan, everything in El Paso basically changed culturally. What happened to the buildings? They brought in lumber. Yeah, they brought in uh, steel, lumber. So and it went from sudden, adobe to uh, sticks. And then another thing happened with that. Oh, thank you. Another thing happened right away. All of a sudden, you needed a fire department because all of a sudden, you had multi-story buildings that would catch on fire, and you had to have ladders. And in the old days, one or two-story adobes. Well, if the interior burned, just put a new roof on. But now when you're burning the whole building down, things started to change. So they did have to have a, a bunch of things different occurred because of the railroads. Progress, who all came in besides the gamblers, Melissa? Oh my God, you had, you had, well, see, you had, the military was aided by the, the, mili the uh, train coming in with supplies and such. It helped Fort Bliss expand even farther. You had your business people, Wells Fargo, you had, oh no, Wells Fargo was before that, but yeah. you had other, a lot of large banking, because also you were connecting not only the east-west path, from going across country, going east-west, you also had north-south, where you had the railroads that were coming from there. So it was a, quite a big industrial hub for us. Well, like it, like what we said, the um, I'm eating popcorn again. You caught me. <laughs> you know, Sorry we used to that. be on radio. We make faces and nobody knows. And it. We don't eat on the radio. <laughs> yeah, we've got to act nice up here or try to. Anyway, and by the way, we are streaming this on. We're st still streaming this uh, live, Aaron. And our thanks to Aaron Barnes and his group of TV guys. Thank you very much for all you're doing here today. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> and as it is. We are going to have a video recording of this, and we'll edit and put this on YouTube as well. But to the subject of the railroads, it made a major change in El Paso. The gambling showed up, the prostitutes showed up, Mining. the business people showed up. Because then the business people saw advantages of being in a business along a rail line. Then the mining people showed up. Well, that takes us to our last topic on the list that was voted on the wall, and that is ASARCO. ASARCO being a major part of El Paso history. The idea of ASARCO was that it was originally the town smelter, T-O-W-N-E. That's a guy's name. And we always thought, oh, they had the town smelter. Then I saw it was spelled like, it's a guy's name. So Mr. Town figured out that he had the radio, excuse me, he had the, the, the Rio Grande, and then he had the, the railroads. And with the, with the water and the railroads, he could then put a smelter there and have everything come and go as he needed. He had to have water to run the smelter and he had to have railroads to get the ore in and out. So all of a sudden, there was a huge industry that just sprang up. What was the year, 1887 or eight? Actually, it was 80. 1888, 88. I believe. 
Bernie, what's the, 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 the one that. building that's going to be left at Asarco is... 87. 87, yeah. Tell us about that building. Well, that was a that's referred to as a headquarters building. That's where the engineers and the, the boss people kept their offices. And uh, the original was Adobe, but then over the years they added sticks and mortar to it. And we've been told by the uh, trustee that that building will stay intact. They're only going to remove the lead and anything that has mercury in it out of it, and it will remain as it is right now. So we'll have that piece of... Um, architecture for post, uh, perpetuity. And that's kind of an exciting thing. So we're hoping at some point down the road, maybe preservation groups like this could occupy that as their headquarters. We'll keep lobbying okay. for that. Well, as great. it is, they're remediating the land, and you have to take them at their word that it's going to be clean. You can also go in and test it, I suppose, when they're gone. But as it is, I've been over there a number of times. I've, I've, been, I've been granted incredible access by the bankruptcy trustee to go in with cameras. Bernie's been going in regularly talking about the history, trying to save what we can, and we have gotten quite a bit of material that we've uh, amassed for museum exhibits. There will be some machinery saved. Some of that machinery in the powerhouse dates from 1909, I think, back in that era. Correct. And a lot of that stuff could be saved if there were a way to do it financially. And so there's an idea that's still available today, is that if we could get enough money together, we could get the bankruptcy trustee for free to move a lot of that powerhouse equipment one time, he'll, he'll move it for free once to a location that will keep it for, for a museum or turn it into a museum. So that's something we should also let people know in El Paso that if you're interested in saving some more of, El, of Asarco's history, it's available for probably the next six weeks, after which they're going to have to tear down the powerhouse. The idea originally from Roberto Puga, the trustee, was to save the entire powerhouse as a museum. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're looking at about $3 million to stabilize the building, another 3 or $4 million to remediate it for tourism. So if, if somebody had too much money, again, that lottery ticket yeah. would be very interesting to see what it could be as a museum to, to machinery, basically. Well, you, Describe you, some of that stuff yeah, in there. I think that oh. it looks like something out of a Frankenstein movie when you walk in there big with the big candles. gears and yeah. meters and, and power. <laughs> and all. The, One of the uh, little sidebars of history uh, many of you have uh, relatives that were in the Army that served here at Fort Bliss, but very few people realize that the Navy had an impact on Asarco. Post-World War II, they brought in a lot of this uh, power-generating equipment from the old freighters that used to travel back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean to supply the forces in, in Europe during the war. And what they did is they took all of that equipment out of those ships and they imported it, quite a bit of it here to El Paso so they could self-generate and keep the uh, Asarco running on their own power. So that those generators are still in there, those banks of meters and switches and so on. So it's, it's something that would be wonderful to keep at least one of those uh, so we could share that with the rest of the world. But as the, uh, as the stacks are scheduled to come down, I was over there last week, and they are, they are preparing the, the landing zone for this thing, the big stack. It's a bizarre process. They've cleaned out the area. They have uh, put down huge sheets of, of plastic that they roll across the desert. I was watching them do that last week. And then they come and put dirt, all, brand new dirt, clean dirt on the top of that. Then they're gonna put another layer of stuff on top of that. Then the stacks hit that and it won't splatter old Asarco stuff everywhere. That's yeah, the, the plan. The dust will be clean dust. If there is any. Yes, ma'am. We have a question. Uh, the, the question is how will the stack coming down affect the cemetery I think you got about 500 yards between the two. I don't think it'll bother it. It's probably not going to bother it. It may shake a grave or two. Yeah, they're not they're not falling that direction. Let's put it that way. From what I what I understand. Yeah, well, the big stack is going straight toward I-10, and they, they put a cone out in the, in the distance there, and they said the top of the stack is going to hit that cone. So we've That's, been lobbying to put a camera there. Is that cone going to hit the city hall? <laughs> With what? I says that tower going to hit the city hall? <laughs> uh, no. City Hall has its own problem. City Hall comes down the next day. So that's going to be a very bizarre weekend. It already is a bizarre weekend in my household, but it's <laughs> even going to be crazy. My son's getting married that day. And we picked oh, the date first. Right. We told the trustee, can you move it? He said no. Yeah. So anyway, but the, but the thing about Asarco as, as an entity, it was a driving force of El Paso's economy for decade after decade after decade. The people who were there living there, their standards of living were the highest that their families had ever known. There's a lady named Monica Perales, PhD, who wrote a book about her family who grew up in Asarco, in the, in the smelter town, the lower smelter. 
And if you need to know what is the Sarko and its influence on people and the people who live there, get her book. It's excellent. By Monica Perales, and it's about it. You can just Google her and a Sarko, you'll probably find the book. Yeah, I think, I think unfortunately, I, the issues that we've all heard about Asarco have been in regards to the soil and the contamination and the, the smoke from the stacks and such. But like I said, people forget this is industry. This is our history. Doctors, lawyers, uh, teachers came out of those families of Smelter Town. Like I said, many of them could not have any other way have been able to afford to send their kids to school if they had not been working at Asarco. And a lot of people we meet, they miss it very dearly. Well, Asarco was, in, in, like I say, in the perfect place because they, Asarco ended up owning mines in Chihuahua. They owned the mines, so then they put them on, their, on the railroad cars, got all the ore up to El Paso, and pretty much owned the process of, of smelting copper. And El Paso was famous for, for decades as a custom smelter specializing in copper. And so much copper came out of here, it was amazing. They built a railroad from Bisbee, Arizona, into El Paso to get the ore for the smelters here. Yeah. So there's a lot of history in of Asarco. And as, as what we're doing right now, the videos we're creating are primarily on the physical plant of what was there. We videotaped everything before they touched it. We have all the video from every little nook and cranny of that property because we had total access. Some of you are here earlier. We showed you video from a hel helmet cam of guys climbing the thing. We also have more video than that that we're going to be finishing in the first video we're putting out of the series. It's called Last Tour of the El Paso Smelter. And that series will be out probably by the end of May. And it'll be focused, the first one, on the large smokestack. And uh, that's going to be a piece of history and a piece of video that you can't replace. And we're not, we're not trying to say yes or no, keep it or don't. That decision apparently has been made. So now as we prepare for the eventuality of here they come, it's going to be a heck of a day. So what the bankruptcy trustee asked me to do, since I'm kind of familiar with it, he said, can you put some cameras over here that people can see on the Internet so that we don't have so many people coming down here trying to look at it in person? Well, you go or don't, it's, they're going to close the valley. The three railroads will close, I-10 will close, Donovan will close. So you're not going to get real close to begin with. We have cameras on the buildings over there today that are streaming online, and we're going to put them a lot more available for everybody to see. And um, we're going to have some close-up cameras, maybe the one where the top hits the ground. It's a weird shot, but if we can take it, we're going to do it. So, yes, sir, you had a thought? I, okay, come you to go. your bagel shop and watch oh. it. There you go. We put tables and chairs out there, and we'll all sit there and have coffee yes, and bagels. So you can serve smoking bagels that day, right? <laughs> Make it loud. <laughs> How are they going to knock it down is the question. We're almost out of time here, but I got time to answer it. Bernie, you want to take a shot at that? Because you know some of that. Yeah, they, what they do is they, they hollow out a portion of it, and they create a void. And then on the other side, they, they, they start to uh, hollow out a portion there. It's sort of like cutting a tree down. So they create a weakness on one side, and then they cut it on the other side on an angle, and then they have uh, uh, explosives around the base. And the explosives will actually start that, that motion, and it'll, it'll drop in one direction. And these guys have done this for many years. They've never, they've never missed so far. <laughs> I tell you, if they miss this one, we're all going to know it. It's going to be exciting. But as hey. it is, they've, they've, they've created uh, physical berms of about 20 feet high of dirt on either side of the impact zone. They're putting this plastic out there, more dirt down. So when it finally does happen, it's probably going to be a pretty clean, rather large, massive event. And they tell me it's going to take about 15 seconds by the time they detonate the explosives for the thing to hit the ground. So that's what's coming on April the 13th. About a half an hour after sunrise. And they're going to drop both of them at the same time. Roughly, I think a few seconds apart, but yeah. pretty much simultaneous. Saturday, 13th of April, Saturday morning. One last question. Yes, sir. The public is like we're saying that they would prefer the public to watch it on TV because they don't want anybody in the valley. There will be uh, probably a perimeter of, of Mesa and uh, on that side and then executive. Downtown, I don't, maybe UTEP, I don't know where. And yeah, you'll have to stay. Yeah, you have to stay north of I-10, uh, west of Sunland Park, or west of Executive. That's as close as you can get. And there's Actually, room at the tramways trying to well, put something together where you can go that, up on the tram that time. I was going to say that Nancy Scarantino was telling us that the tramway is selling space. Are they going to have people available? To, they're going to have rides in the morning to be able to go up there. And so, if you want to get involved in getting a view from the tramway, your your opportunity is is right now to call them and get a reservation because they're going to open it up early in the morning so you can go out and see it. And also they're going to open up the next day, Sunday, for, for City Hall. You can see that from yeah, up there, Yeah, watch too. that one, too, go down. One other group, Mount Cristo Ray Restoration Committee. 
they'll sell you a Jeep ride to the top of Crystal Ray that morning for 100 bucks. Ooh, that'd be fun. It's a good cause, and it's a great view. And uh, we've actually got, where's Fernie? Fernie, we got Fernie. Fernie, did you know you're scheduled to go up on Mount Crystal Ray that morning? Now you know. <laughs> Be ready, Fernie, because Fernie's one of the camera people that we're going to ask to go out there and, and get a Jeep ride with him. Ruben very early in the morning. So He's going to anyway. go like this going, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> well, I think that's about what we had time for here today on the town hall meeting. I really want to thank you guys for, for participating. We, I think, got a better idea of what people think is important. Your thoughts, either I, one of you? I, you know, I think it's a great start, and perhaps we can base our next summit on some of the other topics, and we can just carry it further. Could I add one really quickly? You mentioned being uh, broadcasting live. If you go to Facebook, Old West El Paso Town, uh, you'll get to see the pictures that Anthony and his crew have put together as far as oh, the Old excellent. El Paso. Yeah. And also, when we do the radio show on a regular basis every Saturday morning, it's on KTSM AM 690, we're from 10 a.m. to noon, we put stuff on Facebook constantly. So we're always talking about, hey, you see this picture? Well, we put it on Facebook so you can go take a look at it if you're, if you're tuned into that. Well, that's about what we had time for. Anybody else? Any, I, any I last thoughts? I have one last comment. I want to thank all the volunteers in El Paso that are putting their time, their money, their efforts into keeping and preserving the history of El Paso. I think they deserve a big round of applause. Thank you all very much. And we are El Paso. I am El Paso. Thank you all very much for joining us, and thank you for joining us online. And we still have prizes to give away, so stay tuned when we read off the numbers. Thank you. In fact, Bernie, why don't you go ahead and step up? Okay. Yeah, last three digits, 991, gets this wonderful book and a ride in my Mercedes-Benz that nobody claimed. I could change it.